Hi, thank you. Everybody hear me? I can't hear myself, so. Okay, cool. Hi, my name is Yaron, um, and we're going to talk a little bit about uh, real-time analytics. I know it's the last session of the day, and we're going to try to keep it a little bit light and uh, not go into code and anything like that. Uh, if there's any other specific questions, well, I'll be happy to answer about them uh, later. Um, so again, I've, uh, working at, uh, at Iguazio, uh, we're working with uh, a lot of uh, real-time analytics, machine learning, um, and uh, attaching all that uh, together with uh, serverless. And we'll talk a little bit about uh, uh, what are we doing there. And we're going to talk a little bit about the current challenges of uh, uh, data scientists today in, the, uh, in their day-to-day -day life as well as uh, how we are looking at uh, uh, continuous cloud or native, native uh, uh, serverless architecture in order to solve those problems. Uh, and um, again, just how do we use serverless in order to do that? I'm kind of feeling a little bit cornered here on that uh, stage here. We'll see, maybe we'll start walking there in a, in a few minutes. Um, and what I really want to go over is a few use cases. Some of them I've already seen in different uh, sessions today, but we're going to dive into uh, what are the different uh, stages of those uh, use cases and how do, we, uh, how do we address them and make them uh, work a little bit better. Um, and in order to do that, let's kind of uh, look at uh, some uh, Google uh, research that, uh, uh, you know, we're talking about what does it take in order to do, uh, to build a machine learning uh, product, okay? So in all of those, there's, you know, you gotta define what you're gonna do, you gotta collect the data, you gotta sort the data, you gotta clean the data, uh, you gotta build the model, and then you gotta integrate it into something that would be uh, production-wise. It seems like that the expectation was that a lot of the time would be to optimize uh, the model. And, you know, collecting and defining the KPIs was, uh, defining the KPIs actually is the second largest, but everything else seems to be very, very small. Um, in reality, the reality is completely different. Anybody has an idea what takes the most? Okay. So, in reality, creating the model and optimizing it is like a really small portion of the time. Most of the time is actually being spent on items that are not related to what the data scientist is doing on a day-by-day -day basis. Most of the time it's just integrating, moving data from one place to another, uh, authentications, and, and all sorts of other um, items that are not really related to what you want to do. The data scientists, the, the data engineers, what they want to do is really work on the models just like it's there on the first, uh, uh, first portion over there. And again, that's kind of, uh, that was very interesting. That's, uh, coming out of, uh, uh, you have the source at the bottom there, but it comes out of uh, uh, Google research on a lot of uh, data, data science uh, projects. So again, just looking at that for a second tells you that the real problem is not in the model. The real problem, because models, there's a lot of them and you could use them any way you want. The real problem is how do I get my data into where I want to use it? And talking about that, so we're looking at some other uh, uh, information of what's the value of the data, and we're talking about real time. Um, so a lot of the data, once you get it into, by the time you are uh, collecting the data and sorting the data and doing some ETL or some other uh, cleansing, it's, it's already batch processing and it's, it takes days. It takes a long time. Take, you're talking about heavy, uh, heavy load of moving the data from one place to another, um, you really want to do something that's a little bit more interactive, but that's going to take minutes. But really where we all want to go is real time, where you have an event and you really can use all the data that you have in your position in order to do, make real time decisions and move really, really quickly into um, uh, action based uh, information that would be uh, intelligence and ready and, and kind of uh, uh, based on the real-time information that you just got. Okay. <clears throat> so really what we want to do is in order to get there we need to go from 
static infrastructure into something that would be a little bit more agile. I've heard a lot of discussion today about yarn and uh, uh, a lot of other you know, uh, cluster technologies, but really what we need is we need to have some sort of storage and database. And we'll talk about how and what and how do we interact between multiple kinds. We need some sort of orchestration. I've put Kubernetes over there just because, you know, again, we want to be uh, microservices oriented and we want to be able to do that. Uh, we'll talk about serverless in a minute. But we want to do that in a real uh, time sensitive environment. So just creating a zookeeper with everything else that's going to run behind it does not make a lot of sense. And on top of that, you have a lot of um, microservices depends on what exactly you want to do. And then you can run your business logic. So having said that, what we really, in order to do that in real time, what we really want to do is we want to consume everything that's kind of from that, uh, I guess it's an orange line over there, to the bottom, and we want to innovate on the top layers, not on the bottom layers. And what we're busy with is just making sure that that bottom layer is available, it's working, how much we use it, and so on and so forth. That should be pretty much very, very simple. But it's not today. Today, um, the pipeline and the way that it works, it's very complex and it's very siloed. If we look, we have like a lot of sources, whether it's uh, real-time sources or whether it's uh, uh, data lake or warehouse. And uh, by the way, I'm going to stop before I continue here and say, if you have any questions, please raise your hand. Let's make it a little bit more interactive. And um, feel free to stop me, OK? Um, so going back to that, if we, we have multiple data sources and you know, you have data engineers, you have the data science, and you have the app developers. And those are three different independent siloed uh, infrastructures today. What does it mean? It means that you got to get that information from the data source. And you do some sort of an ETL or processing and, and batching. And again, we want to we move that to be a little bit more uh, real time. Then you kind of throw it over the fence to the data scientist in order to do um, modeling and, and inferring and some kind of uh, machine learning algorithms and test them. And only after that, you, when you have the model, you can go and uh, deploy and kind of de uh, develop your um, interactive app. And then you could do uh, triggering or display that. In order to do that, each one of those needs their data source, their compute, their, whether it's CPUs or GPUs or a combination of thereof. You got to have multiple management interfaces for all that. And that becomes really, really complex. And, um, and it's just not manageable. It's not manageable at scale. It's not manageable at real time. And, and it's very, this is what sets some, a lot of the, the uh, abilities that we have in, um, in all the wonderful machine learning and, and AI that we have out there. To be um, to actually not get not make it into production, you know. Again, just the guy before me said, a lot of the times you think about something, and by the time you try to build some infra some uh, basic model and figure it out, it takes a couple of weeks, and at that time, by that time, that information is not interesting. So, how do I make sure that that, inf that information is going to be relevant? and immediate, and I can actually show a business value right after um, I, I have that idea of some new data that I want to use. <clears throat> so in order to do that, you actually need a, a single, continuous pipeline that is focused on, not just on the, on the algorithm, it's focused on production. Because we saw earlier that we spend most of our time just collecting the data. So what if I could use the same data both for production and for uh, gathering the information and have the data scientists and uh, the, the uh, data engineers all work on the same real-time information with a single interface that would, that would look, feel, and smell exactly the same, whether they're doing development, whether they're doing production. I don't need to cut a small piece, move it from one lab to, 
to another, uh, have multiple infrastructures. I want to do all of that, and I want to do that in a way that would be real-time and historical, that would be um, simple, and yet with uh, a lot of uh, production readiness in mind, where I can have uh, all that information available to me at all times. It doesn't matter who's looking at it. Of course, there's got to be uh, you know, user authentication and, and so on and so forth. But I could do that once. And if I'm in an uh, you know, organization and I have uh, any type of uh, um, user authentication already in there, I could just connect it to my uh, uh, enterprise level uh, user authentication and just use that. Uh, of course, the, the guys that are doing the uh, application at the end would have less uh, 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 access to, to whatever they need. Right? <clears throat> so how do we do that? Uh, basically, the, one of the easiest ways to do that is using uh, serverless. Because at that point, I can take the same information and I could use uh, extreme performance. I could instantiate as many services as I need. Uh, we're talking uh, top, uh, I guess for us, the top right, there is uh, uh, that uh, Superman guy, that's uh, Nucleo, that's, uh, uh, that's our open source uh, serverless infrastructure that is actually specifically designed for machine learning. And what does it allow you? It allows you to do multiple instances with zero copies so you don't have to copy the information. It is a lot faster, and it is designed to do long tasks, not just specific, short-lived, um, single tasks like a, a Lambda or some other cloud infrastructure uh, uh, serverless uh, that kind of created the standard of, uh, I want to do it very, very short. I want it, especially in machine learning, when you have some batch processing, you want something that would be a little bit more long-lived. You want it to have some sort of a persistent storage. So once you marry the two of those uh, with the same concept of serverless where you don't really want to use all the infrastructure of writing code, you just want to write your piece of code and make sure that everything, you know, all the infrastructure uh, runs it, then you can get to, uh, to extreme uh, uh, um, workloads running in parallel. Uh, it has a built-in, for example, in our case, the GPU support. So from a resource management, I could do just exploration on CPU and production on GPU while all the tools and everything else looks and smells exactly the same. Okay? If, I have, uh, if I ran out of resources, for example, on a GPU, I can now use just a CPU because I don't have any more and I want my application to continue to run. And then again, it would obviously take longer. We cannot you know, manufacture uh, resources, but it does not... Again, you consume the, the infrastructure that you have. You're not bound to, okay, that's what I have, and I have to you know, handle exceptions and so on and so forth. Um, we have a lot of uh, AI features in terms of balancing and uh, uh, checkpoints in order to, uh, to use the right, uh, right tools for the task. We just talked a little bit about uh, GPUs and CPUs and so on. From a triggering point of view, we're, uh, we're talking, again, we've, I've heard a lot about uh, you know, Kafka streams and so on and so forth. I don't really care what the source is. We have pretty much a you know, wide array of uh, triggers, whether it's a uh, batch processing locally to a Kafka stream to a RabbitMQ or to some other uh, Kinesis or some other external sources. All of them are just a trigger in order to instantiate the, uh, uh, the serverless function that would run your machine learning or, or, or ETL or one after the other, after the other, after the other. And we'll, we'll see some example of that uh, in a second. And the last but not least, again, one thing that is really critical for machine learning is the statefulness. We want to make sure that the data binding is going to stay there. It's, it's not something that's going to run once, and when it wakes up the next time, I got to start everything from scratch. I, I want it to have some sort of memory, some sort of volumes that I can attach to, and so on. OK? And you know, again, all of that is basically open source. You can go download and play with that uh, uh, at, at your uh, convenience. 
All right. So I'm going to pause here for a second and see if we have any questions before we dive into some more use cases of how do we use that technology in time applications uh, today. So any questions so far? Yes, sir. Say that one more time. So uh, can this uh, nucleo, uh, nucleo be scaled up? Of course. By, um, OK. Yeah, so uh, it's. Can it be done on the fly? Uh, see, like, on I'm the fly, yes. Fly it can be scaled load. up on the fly. Uh, it is. So there is, again, this is a, you, you can download it as an open source. You need to attach it into some sort of an infrastructure to say, what type of uh, information do I have? And when you have that information, you can scale up. It's running in the background behind that as, uh, if you remember, let's go back a couple of slides here. Uh, sorry, yeah. Uh, it's running on top of Kubernetes. So I can instantiate as many nodes as, or as many instances as I want based on my Kubernetes cluster, which is you can provide your own. You can actually do it like with, if you want to do uh, OpenShift rather than Kubernetes, you could do that as well. Uh, what we have as a default is Kubernetes. Does that answer your question? Okay, any more questions? I saw some other. Nope. Okay. So moving forward. Uh, to um, some kind of some uh, sort of use cases of how do we uh, build intelligent application. So hopefully the sound would work here. Let's just start with a small. Nope. I guess not. Can I see the list of drivers? Let's try it again. Show me some cars. There are 1383 drivers in Phoenix right now. How many of them are busy at the moment? 412 of 1384 drivers are busy at the moment. That's 29% of them. Can I see the list of drivers? Here they are, starting with Ruby Naquin. Uh, what about our income total in the last week? Looks like you made the most bank on Sunday with around 18,600 bitcoins. And how much on average did this cost each customer? Here you go. Yeah, I think we're done, I think. Yeah, so hopefully you could uh, hear at least some of it. But what we saw is a very uh, basic demo of uh, uh, voice-driven application that provides real-time information to, uh, in, this, in this case, the user that was just inquiring about uh, uh, about his drivers and how, to, how busy are they and so on and so forth. But what does it really entail on the, on the back end? So there is some real-time information coming in both from Google Maps and uh, the taxi drivers or the, the cars that were used in that uh, particular example. And they're going into a serverless function that update their location and save it as, uh, on a persistent storage. That is connected to a Spark AI in the back in the back office, and then when a query comes in from that uh, smart home device, in that uh, particular case, I believe it was a, uh, an, an Echo or a, a, I can't even remember what it was. Um, then the voice query is using uh, again a, a native language translation. It goes using a Presto API to go do uh, SQL queries to figure out what exactly was done um, um, based on the real-time information that was updated by the Spark uh, uh, information, and provides that both as voice and a UI interaction. Okay? Uh, that, by the way, took probably about two to three days to kind of build that demo, just in terms of how much time it takes to gather that information and use it and write it. Uh, and both share it with the, the group of people that we're working on it, all right? Um, another use case that's kind of uh, uh, interesting is analysis of the financial da data. In this case, uh, the example here, and most of the examples are really you know, simple on, on the one hand, but they just show the power of 
both the platform and how do you actually connect all the, all the dots together. And that particular one is integrating both real-time streaming data as well as uh, text tweets or uh, non-SQL data as well as uh, SQL data all being combined together and queries are being run on them. What does that mean? It means that if I want to use, for example, prediction of stock prices, uh, what I really want to do is, in, and again, in this case, we were using uh, Twitter feeds in order to do, uh, to figure out, okay, the company is tweeting or doing something, that's all non-SQL data, uh, along with the historical SQL data that comes in uh, that you kind of download from, from the internet. Uh, kind of combined with a real-time series that comes in as a stream from, uh, from the trading floor. All of that together would create some sort of a prediction of uh, what the stock price is going to do. Again, something that uh, took about uh, two to three days to, uh, to build in terms of just show the proof of concept, obviously, when you want to make sure that that's uh, bulletproof from a uh, user perspective and so on, that, that's going to take a little longer. Uh, another example is uh, network operations. A lot of uh, uh, what we've seen a lot is network operations, uh, uh, people that are trying to predict outages in the network. And again, there's the, the breadth of information that comes in out of the network device is just phenomenal. Uh, just changing models, figuring out what models you want to use, how do you want to use them, and feeding all that information back in order to create some sort of predictions um, what's going to happen next when there's going to be some breakdowns in the network uh, so I could do preventative maintenance to actually prevent uh, failures from occur in the network. Uh, that particular thing is implemented in uh, uh, Singtel uh, and after abandoning a project like that for I believe it was something more than six months we've, uh, we've been able to implement that within weeks. Okay, just again, completing the pipeline with something that is not siloed, that you could look at the, at the real-time data and making decisions uh, both on the models and on how you're going to present it to the users in real time and not by uh, collecting data and, and using an old, uh, weak old data and so on. Uh, okay. So uh, I think that, okay, that, that one is... Uh, uh, just how the, that particular uh, implementation was, it was uh, both processing of NetFlow data, real-time telemetry from uh, the, the network devices, as well as, uh, as some NLP processing from, from logs. That was, uh, again, you're taking a flat, line, flat file logs, providing that then we're using NLP, just like what we heard in the first example, and using all of that on top of uh, real-time database, uh, using Sparks to, uh, to do uh, machine learning models and predict uh, failures. And what you can see on the bottom there is an actual picture from, uh, from today's network operation of showing, okay, that's what we see in terms of the prediction of how the network's gonna behave. Okay. Uh, I've actually seen that today probably twice of real-time uh, airport uh, operations. So again, we have uh, uh, a leading airport that uh, uses, again, multiple sources of data in order to create some sort of predictions, whether it's flight statuses, whether it's, you know, number of passengers moving around with their uh, cell phones in the area, uh, telemetry from both the ground and, uh, uh, and the staff, and uh, the, schedule, the flight schedule itself goes into real-time uh, database, SQL. Uh, and in this case, again, what we really talk, we, we talked a little bit about that, but the power is when you are, and I've heard a lot about people talking about SQL versus non-SQL versus uh, time series. It's really not one versus the other. It's whatever information that you have at the right time. And the power is if I can do a query of a SQL database on the one hand, combine it with some key value from another pointer, um, 
and attach that to a time series or a real-time stream of whatever, and then make a decision, that's where I really have some power. Now, if I combine that with some on-the-fly ETLs where I don't really have to clean the data before I even use it, uh, now I can make some real-time decisions and, and actually provide that with, um, you know, again, in, in this case, uh, real-time application. Just as an example, okay, that airplane is going to be delayed. Let's take the staff that was supposed to be there and redirect them to somewhere else in order to, for not another flight to get delayed and so on, all in real time. Okay? Any questions so far? Yes, sir. I don't understand because you are when you are training model, right? Uh, uh, can you can you, uh, you barely hear you? Uh, yeah. Uh, so I was saying uh, when you are saying real time, right? You are still training some ML models, and I am assuming that model training is, will still take some time. So when you say real time, what does that actually mean? Yeah. Okay, great question. So real time, let, let's distinguish between the uh, phases, if you will, of the project. Okay. Uh, you still have to provide training to the model. That is absolutely true. You, you, can't, you can't bypass that stage. But first, real-time database is something, let's say a stream that comes in of uh, real-time information from, uh, from what, whatever environment right now. Um, that is going to be the feed to the model after it was trained. But the real uh, value is now, over time, I can see that uh, my initial training was kind of, uh, let's call it only 93%, and I want to increase it to 96. I have all that historical data already. I have all the results already. I can make adjustment to the model pretty much at real time to increase my, uh, my results. So, okay. so when you're saying you're using older model and then you're using the current real-time data to make changes into that model, uh, what kind of model are you using there? Because most of the model will be based on the complete data you give it at one time. So, Yes, uh, so absolutely. So again, um, I cannot really talk about the specific models that we're using here because that was uh, part, part of that development. But the, the idea is that, again, if you're taking an existing model, um, you could just increase the training of that. You, know, you could do like retraining and upload the model. That would be like the simplest way to do that. If you want to do a, uh, uh, an evolving model, then you would have to, uh, you know, it's, it would not be like one of the, uh, I don't know, image recognition out of the box model that, that you would use. Uh, hang yes, on. I'll Let give it to you. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So are you, are you talking about transfer learning over here? Because you said that the model can evolve. So one of, one of the ways to do that would be transfer learning. Transfer learning, but again, transfer learning means that you start with a known thing and you transfer, you know, you transfer more data to it. As I said, that would be like the simple way of doing an on-the-fly training would be a transfer learning. Absolutely. But, I mean, then what is the definition of real time over here? I mean, when you say real time, it is just a time threshold because even transfer learning will take some time, right? I mean. So, absolutely. So the, the idea of a, the real time is right now here, it's not a real time uh, learning mechanism, if you will. It, the real time in this case is the real time information that comes in from multiple sources and you already have a model that you're running into. Um, it's probably not advisable at this stage to do uh, a continuous real time learning because you don't know, I, I wouldn't know at this point how well the model would behave on a real time without testing it, and you don't want to do that right. in a production environment, right? Um, but what we do see is if I take that information and I do a real time experiment of letting that model learn, I'm not going to use it to you know, send people around, but I could do that on, a, uh, on the same data that comes in at real time, and I could see if the model is, is improving or uh, declining. 
okay? Um, I don't think that we're at, you know, from an industry perspective, I don't think we're at the stage where you could actually let it roam free in, in a production environment at this point. I mean, it's, it's going to take a little bit longer. Okay. Yes, sir. Yeah. So, uh, like, is it something where you're using some uh, standard database, or is it like Spark in memory, uh, which you are talking about? So, okay. S uh, Spark in memory, first of all, uh, I'm not talking about uh, Spark in memory in those slides. In those slides, we'll actually see in the next example. Those would be like a Kinesis or a streaming database that would be uh, an ongoing information flowing from a, a real-time environment. For, for example, in this case, it's a vehicle telemetry. Right, so that information is keep on flowing. It's not a, um, it, it's a live stream, right? Uh, so you have to cleanse it and do that all in real time. Uh, in memory Spark, yes, I mean, you could use that and we do, we do use that and leverage that, but that, I wouldn't consider that real time. That would still be kind of a batch as far as I'm concerned. Any more questions? Yes, sir. Taxi service, okay. So this one. Is that, uh, how did you get the uh, real-time uh, taxi uh, information? Like, do, do you have any, do you, did you use any uh, public API for that? Uh, yes, so we use public API for, for what you're talking about, like the location of the car? Yeah. So that was, uh, um, yeah, API for the cars that was uh, driven by, um, a device that was in the car, like uh, uh, most of the taxi drivers would have a real-time GPS for, for uh, okay. location okay. and um, uh, dispatch. Okay, okay. Yeah. So it, this particular project was for a specific taxi yeah, company. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Okay. And what is this uh, Spark AI doing here? This, in the this puzzle the pieces? Uh, you have the puzzle pieces there. Yes. Uh, what is this uh, Spark AI doing in the entire thing? So in this case, the Spark, the, what Spark is doing in here, it's taking all that information from, uh, from both the location and the location of the car, uh, and that actually creates the, uh, uh, I guess, the stream that would later be used to, to do the Presto uh, SQL. Yeah, and Spark, Spark a, makes sense, but how about AI? What AI part it is doing? I would have to get back to you. Okay. On this. Thank you. Okay. All right. And I think after that, let's see. Okay. So um, last, uh, I think the last example here is a uh, predictive maintenance for an IoT uh, an IoT devices. So there's a lot of uh, machines that are on a uh, production floor, uh, running uh, or sending streams of data. That stream of data is going into a processor. Again, it's running a serverless uh, processor um, that create real-time alerts. So if something fails, then you have a real-time alert. But on top of that, they're aggregating streams together as a time series vectors that would be saved. Uh, and then they're sending that as a non-SQL to a dashboard on the one hand, but also to a prediction mechanism uh, on the back end to do some predictive uh, alerts. And that's being run specifically in that case every 15 minutes, but again, it's all configurable. And once you do that, you can also take that time series and use another function to upload only the portion that is interesting to you to the cloud. And in that case, I believe it was a, uh, uh, a Google Cloud. That kind, that kind of uh, task could run a little bit longer, like every six hours or so. And from that point, I can take the information that I have in the cloud and say, okay, now I can understand something about those IOTs. I can update the model and uh, make sure that I, I kind of update the prediction doing that. Okay? And all of that is... So again, you're kind of combining the smarts of the cloud, but with an intelligent edge that would be able to, um, to 
again, you don't want to upload all those pretty much petabytes at that point to the cloud just to do some sort of uh, very simple predictive. Uh, you want to do that somewhere locally in the, uh, uh, on the production floor in that uh, particular factory in this case. Okay. All right. So in terms of summary, um, what we really want to do is we want to build a, a continuous development of uh, something that would be predictive and would run faster. We don't want to waste time on uh, collecting the data or just uh, understanding what we need to do. We want to focus on using the data, not on collecting it. Uh, we, want to, uh, we want to have an integration approach of all that, all that pieces needs to come in together like a puzzle, uh, and we want to use both cloud native and microservices, again, there's no point in building something else today. It's already been, uh, we already know that that's where things are going. Um, and with that, any more questions? Yes. Um, so you talked about having like one database for um, data engineers, data scientists, mm -hmm. and um, production. Um, does, is there any like um, performance impact? Like uh, for the data engineers, if they're running a really huge process and it's taking a lot of the, um, uh, I mean, the resources, it's gonna, is it impact? No. Okay, it's, it's a great question. Um, there's, basically there's no performance impact because what you're doing is, and we kind of talked a little bit about that, but not, not a lot, uh, there is what's called a zero, zero copy. So although I do some processing, each one of the processing is being done on, a, on, a, on its own microservices function. So even if you do it on the same piece of data, it would run on two different locations, so there's no performance impact between the two. Okay. Any more questions? Yes, sir. So um, uh, uh, this talk has um, uh, included uh, like a lot of interesting projects you have uh, already done. Uh, I wonder, um, is this um, based on the uh, Nucleo, the tool, that will support all the uh, architectural ideas we're discussing mm -hmm. here? Yes. Which is um, so yes. abstract, abstract idea. No, no. So uh, all of those are actual deployment that was done uh, by people, but open, open source community people that has been using that too. Uh, okay. Okay, it's, it's completely, again, it's completely open source. Um, you can download it today, you could use it. And um, again, all of those examples are public examples that, uh, uh, that we have helped at some point in time to kind of, uh, whether it is combine or, or interact with, but uh, they're all uh, completely independent. It's not I something see. that we've created. I see, so uh, this uh, looks like, does uh, include that streaming, uh, this yes. kind of function. Is this on, actually on, on top of Spark, or is this a standalone uh, No, the, all the streamings were on top, a lot of that was on top of Spark. We, we do have, so uh, in our platform, we do have Spark integration natively, so oh. you can instantiate a Spark cluster in, um, in our platform, and if you want to use Spark, you, you just have it available right there. Okay. Thank you. Any more questions? So often uh, when we build uh, predictive analytical models, uh, all the features may not be coming directly from the stream, and we need to connect to other organizational warehouses and fetch some other uh, data. Is this platform has some kind of accelerators where yes. we can buffer data or? Great, great question. So again, um, the, as I've mentioned a little bit uh, before, the power of the platform is actually when you can combine a, you know, let's say a key value with a SQL, with a time series, with a Hadoop uh, cluster, with an S3 bucket. If you take all of them together and you want to say, I want to take the name from here and the, the value from there and this from here and kind of mix them together, that's where the power of the platform is. So you have one tool both for development and for deployment. You have the same data, so you don't have, oh, I've got like a small sanitized 
data pool that I'm working with, and later on when I take it into production, I have to redo a lot of the ETLs for it. So it's all kind of in the same place, using the same standard tools in a pipeline that allows you to go from inception to production uh, in a very short amount of time with the same tools. Okay. Interesting. Thank you so much. Any more questions? Okay. If you want, I'll be staying here for a few minutes so you can come and talk to me. Thank you. All right. Thank you, guys.